All right, we are privileged to have in our midst three illustrious rabbis, great orators, peripatetic scholars, and all the rest of the adjectives that go along with that. That would be Rabbi Manus Friedman, Rabbi Yitzhak Shachat, Rabbi Pinchas Taylor, who will be sitting here today as our panelists. Give him a round of applause. We give him a bigger round of applause when we're done. The way the crossfire works, the rules and regulations. I'll ask a question to one of the particular rabbis. I have 60 seconds to answer it. There's actually a timer here. And as you know, most rabbis are not verbose whatsoever, so there should not be a problem. Rabbis? I brought my own watch. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and he's on English time. Um, at the conclusion of the questions that were submitted somewhere before the uh, retreat began, if there's time, I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Mm. Uh, in the event we do have time to do that, I'll ask you to please make sure that you enunciate your question clearly and loudly. With that, first question, Rabbi Manus Friedman. The Torah requires us to live every single Jew, but there's a guy I know with a terrible personality and massive character defects I just can't stand. I know that guy. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> the clock is running. To really love people means you feel connected whether it feels good or it feels bad. So the fact that this is your fellow Jew and you have to put up with him, that's real love. Okay, well, bearing that in mind, uh, Rabbi Shochar, what happens if it's the finest Wait, Jewish anti-Semite you met? Just, just before you carry on, does he get those extra seconds on credit? Oh, you want, uh, you want to buy his time? No, no, he should have... But Those extra add more? seconds on credit for the next time. Uh, okay, I will figure that out. Don't you worry, do that. that's not usually a problem. But now that I mentioned it, what's that? What would you like to add to what Rabbi Freeman said since he had extra 30 seconds? Um, I think it's you I love, it's only your guts I can't stand. <laughs> Rabbi Taylor, do you have any problem with someone's guts? I, I don't. You don't? <laughs> well, you know, okay. we hate the sin, not the sinner. That's always the bottom line, right? There you go. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Thank you. All right, Rabbi Shochat, that was very good. And since you're next, as God is not time-bound and thus is in the future just as he is in the present, from his perspective, all my future choices have already been made. As such, can I really do anything other than what is destined for me? Yes. Good. By definition. <laughs> um, if I look into a crystal ball and I know that you're going to walk out of this room and you're going to trip on your way out over some ice cream, the fact that I know that you're going to do that doesn't essentially make you do that. It's still your choice to walk out of the room, make that right turn, and ultimately walk in the direction of that ice cream. So God's foreknowledge doesn't impede on my actual free choice. That's number one. Number two, what is predetermined essentially is that I'm going to start at point A and I'm going to end up at point B. But anyone can walk out of this room at the end of the retreat and choose how they're going to go home, whether by plane, whether by foot, whether taking the longer scenic route or the shorter route or whatever it is. And every single route you choose to take is going to have its own particular benefits or consequences, as it were. So what is predetermined is your starting point of A and your end result of B. How you choose to go from A to B is in your own hands. And finally, Ultimately, there are many dispositions as they are associated with every personality. I can be Yitzchak Shachat A up above, Yitzchak Shachat B up above, and Yitzchak Shachat C up above. And depending in accordance with which particular I choose to act, God has already a predetermined end result. So I can act in accordance with Yitzchak Shachat A and God has a predetermined end result. But say, for example, through Teshuvah or through Tefillah or through Tzedakah, I now become Yitzchak Shachat C, which has an altogether different predetermined end result. But the choice from A to C is still my choice. Thank you. Rabbi Friedman, would that be to the extent of going for triples in the buffet line tonight? What? The freedom of choice thing. Oh, Can hmm. I really stop myself? Well, th look, the question is only a question. If you assume that God made a plan and then gave you freedom of choice, that would be a problem because his plan is infallible. So how could you still have freedom of choice? But what if he first looks to see what your freedom of choice is, what choices you make, and then based on your choices, he makes his plan? Then there's no problem at all. On the contrary, it's a huge compliment. God's vast eternal plan is based on the choices we are going to make. So if I choose to go to the right, God makes a plan for that. 
If I choose to go to the left, God makes a plan for that. So what happens above in God's plan comes from my choice. That was perfect. 60 seconds on, that was God's plan. 60 seconds on nose. <laughs> I'm very impressed, Rabbi Friedman. All right, Rabbi Taylor, my rabbi advised me to go slowly and take baby steps on my path toward becoming Torah observant. Does this mean that I officially have permission not to keep a mitzvah until I am ready for it? So it's interesting that um, when Jacob, our forefather, was, had his famous dream of a ladder going into the heavens and angels going up and down, the commentary is right over there that the word ladder that's used, the ladder going into the heaven, has the same numeric value in Hebrew as the word for Sinai. Sulam, ladder, and Sinai have the exact same numeric value. So our connection with God through Torah observance is like a ladder, taking small practical steps at the same time. There was a really interesting little cartoon that was going around that I saw where there's a guy on the left who had his way, way up high on the ladder. He has little small steps and he's able to climb to the top. And the guy on the right who has these large steps in between and he's trying to jump to the first, to the first step and he can't get to it. And the guy with the small steps is much higher. What your rabbi is telling you is not that it's okay to sin. He's telling if you don't take small steps, your ladder is not going to take you anywhere. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. Rabbi Manus Friedman, my teenage son prefers watching the ball game over joining our Shabbat meal. What should I do? I guess it depends which team he's watching, right? Is that... <laughs> Rabbi Friedman. Admit that you would also be rather watching and go uh, join him. Yeah, I plead the <laughs> fifth, sixth, and seventh. <laughs> You know, if, if, it's bo if it bothers you that he's not observing Shabbos so mm -hmm. that he's watching the baseball game, it's going to become a point of contention and it's going to get between you and your relationship is going to suffer. If, on the other hand, you really miss him, you would much rather have him sitting with you because you like his company, because you want to be close, I doubt that's going to cause any problems. So the motivation here is crucial. Are you being critical of his non-observance, or are you being a father who likes his son's company? But what should you do? I beg to differ on that. There's a value at stake here. Can we set, reset the clock? Rabbi Shacha took a mulligan. No, you can keep it going. <laughs> that was just my counter to what Rabbi oh, Friedman just you don't said. Want to buy the whole mulligan. Your Five question seconds. was, what should you do? Regardless of the motive, do you let the kid just do what he wants to do, or are there certain absolute values that should never be compromised? To my mind, if something remains negotiable with you, then it will invariably remain always eminently negotiable with that child as well. If certain things are absolutes with you and you convey that to your child with the same conviction as you would say to the child, don't run into the road, then those things remain absolutes with the child as they grow older as well. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. Do you beg to differ with Rabbi Shochet at all? I was thinking about dinner, actually. Okay, good. <laughs> Bearing that in mind, Rabbi Shocha, next question. In Ethics of Our Father, it says, quote, Such is the way of Torah, bread with salt you shall eat, water in small measure you shall drink, and upon the ground you shall sleep. Live a life of deprivation and toil in Torah. So are we all supposed to be strict ascetics? This retreat sure doesn't seem to follow those rules. <laughs> I'm actually reminded of a story about a woman who made her way to Tibet. Jewish lady and huge line to go see the Dalai Lama and she blagged her way all the way through I just want to see him I just want three words and they said okay the letters to the front of the line please let me go in just three words they said okay they let her in she's finally in the inner sanctum and they say to remember just three words and she says just three words she goes over to him and she says hi me come home <laughs> the point is that we don't believe in asceticism in Judaism whatsoever. I think what the mission is looking to convey is about having balance. In other words, at the end of the day, do not go after your material pursuits at the expense of spiritual aspirations. So you need to have balance between what you're going to be eating, pursuing, living, against what you're also going to have to prioritize in your life, and that is obviously your essential spiritual learning, growth, and development. And I say to you that we are now in the summer. Every yeshiva is pretty much closed. I suggest 
that there is no more Torah learning going on anywhere else in the world as much as there is right now at the National Jewish Retreat. All right, so if we're doing that much one. Torah learning, we're allowed to have the commensurate food to balance that out Nothing against Nothing like it. a shameless plug. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shulka. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Fima, are you a fan of asceticism by any, by any chance? Oh, yeah. You are. <laughs> For everybody else. For everybody else. <laughs> okay, good. Rabbi Taylor. <clears throat> Uh, I recently came across a verse in the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, that states, quote, He who increases knowledge increases pain. So should I stop increasing my knowledge to avoid the pain? It's like Jewish psychology. <laughs> Rabbi Taylor. Well, clearly the, <clears throat> we shouldn't stop knowing. that Rabbi Friedman has a, an organization called It's Good to Know. So I mean, you have to keep knowing. Knowing is a good thing in Judaism. The, someone once asked the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, about this particular verse. And they said, what, what does it mean? Increasing knowledge increases pain. And so the Rebbe said that when a person doesn't know anything, when a person is a fool, they can pretty much think that everything is good within themselves, good within the world. They live in a fool's paradise. But when a person starts engaging in the Torah and starts appreciating the commandments and starts appreciating the lifestyle, and then appreciates how much they don't know and how much growth they need, how much growth is, is needed to, in, in their own system, they become somewhat dissatisfied with themselves. It can be painful. But what the verse is telling us is these are the healthy, growing pains of spiritual development. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. Wow, under 60 seconds. That was very good. <clears throat> Rabbi Friedman, what is so special about being called up for an aliyah? other than to pledge your life savings, you know, stuff like that. Actually, the beauty of it is being called up to an aliyah can be seen two ways. Either you are elevated by being called to the Torah, or you get to elevate the Torah by making the bracha over it and reading from it. I like the second idea. The Torah becomes Torah when you study it, when you make a bracha over it, when you commit yourself to it. So an aliyah means you have the opportunity to elevate the Torah. And that's huge. Uh, Rabbi Taylor, did you want to add something? <clears throat> We're playing this one safe. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> Rabbi Shochet, I learned when it comes to charity... We're allowed and even supposed to test God to see if he'll reward us with riches for fulfilling this mitzvah. So does every Jew who gives charity become rich? It sure doesn't seem that way to me. In a word, yes. After all, God says so. And God, in fact, in, in fact encourages us and implores us to actually test him. What is it, that story about, and I shared this this morning, the girl who's so spoiled with everything she has in life and then she goes to a rabbi and she says rabbi i'm spoiled once again both chaim and moshe love me which one do you think i'm going to marry who's going to be the lucky one and the rabbi replied moshe is going to marry you chaim is going to be the lucky one <laughs> you know if you happen to be spoiled in life make sure to share those spoils god promises you that when you do you will be the lucky one not always does it work immediately quid pro quo because if it did there'd be no free choice in the whole charity giving it'd be the single best investment you can make if every time i'm going to give ten dollars going to immediately get back twenty dollars then I'd be a fool to get involved in any other business altogether by basic rationale if you give a penny a day and then you're going to get back two and then tomorrow you give two you get back four etc by day 24 you'd have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank so it's a process of god doing a repayment but it might be something of a delayed repayment or it might be expressed in some other means and by some other kind of chesed in your life other kinds of compassion and benevolence in your life that you don't even know that you aren't even aware and you will only ever become aware of in due course or in the hereafter but Thank god you. does promise so you do you and god will do his Thank you, Rabbi Shocha. Rabbi Friedman, is there a limit to say how much I should give? There's a limit to how much you're obligated to give, but there is no limit to how much you can be, how generous you can be. Although you have to be realistic and not mess up your life. So uh, with good judgment, there really is no limit. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Taylor, is Judaism too focused... <clears throat> 
on physical rituals at the expense of mindfulness and the inner experience. Why does a spiritual God care about physical deeds? Well, one of the things that we know is that every commandment has a physical aspect of how it's completed and a spiritual aspect. So we're certainly supposed to have the mindfulness and have the inner experience whenever we're doing any of the commandments. But one of the things that we're taught is that the entire purpose that this world was created for was to make this world, which conceals godliness, which was built to conceal godliness, that we, through, our, through observing the commandments, make it a place that reveals godliness. Revealing godliness in the place that conceals godliness is only done through physical action. Another thing that happens magically when we do the actions that we're supposed to do is that all of the mindfulness, all of the benefits of the mindfulness are elevated by default. Once, uh, there was a congregant who once went to their rabbi and said, Rabbi, I'm not observant of the Torah because I don't believe in God. And the rabbi said, you don't believe in God because you don't observe the Torah. In other words, it's through the actions that we refine our mind and elevate ourselves in order to uplift the world. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. Rabbi Shochet, did you want to add something to that? No, I'm in total agreement. Okay, good. Thank you. Can we change the premise? All right, uh, Rabbi Friedman, let's change the premise. <laughs> The assumption that God is spiritual is not correct at all. Who says God is spiritual? God created heaven and earth. Heaven is spiritual, earth is physical. God created them both. So what is God? He's God. And to him, the spiritual is no better, no closer, no more impressive than the physical. In fact, he's more interested in the physical. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Only I would have to come in on that and simply oh, say... Oh, well, all right. You're out of, you're out of business. Now. I'm out of, I'm out of business. <laughs> we all know the Hasidic expression, right? God created from the spiritual the material, and our objective is to turn the material back into spiritual, because that remains the primary purpose and objective of our existence. That's it. Okay, Rabbi Friedman, will the perhaps spiritual God ever allow me to take a small <laughs> vacation from all my religious obligations, maybe like one day a month or something like that, sometimes things are just too overwhelming for me. I think if you see it as an obligation, it is overwhelming. Like uh, Ten Commandments are a lot if you're counting. So if you see it as an obligation, you're already burdened. You're already burnt out. It's just a matter of when you're going to quit. But if you think of it as serving the Creator, I was born to serve my Creator. If you're serving Him, then you don't get burnt out. It's only if you take it as your own burden, your own obligation, your own destiny, you know, am I going to go to heaven, am I going to go to hell, that becomes very burdensome and you can get burnt out. But not if you're serving Him. If you're serving him, it is always joyful. Ivdu es Hashem is always besimcha. I'm going to go out on a limb over here. Rabbi Friedman, have you ever felt burnt out? Yes. Got really quiet and that in the room now. What? You know what I'm saying? Now that awkward <laughs> quietness. <laughs> oh, yeah. We won't ask for any further details. It's not Sunday and confession. It's not until Sunday. <laughs> Unless you want to offer. I mean, that's up to you. When you start to, uh, to adopt the obligation as yours, and this is a project about you, the you will wear you down. But if it's about him, he doesn't get tired, you don't get tired, it's all up, upwards and onwards, and it gives you strength, it doesn't drain you. So if you're feeling drained, it's because you've taken it too much on a personal level, it's too much about yourself, and that can be very heavy. Thank you. Rabbi Shochet, with all the death, illness, and economic dislocation that the recent COVID pandemic wrought in its wake, it seems like the world has taken a giant step away from the Messianic era. As a result, I find it hard to still believe that we are on the cusp of redemption. What say you? What say I? Um, Actually, I mean, the idea of suffering doesn't equal that we are now further away from the messianic redemption. On the contrary, 
as Chazal, our sages, tell us, sometimes when you are in that darkest pit, that's when God says, cry out and I will be there to redeem you. The darkest point of night is just before dawn. So when we're undergoing such extreme turmoil, then if anything, that is a reflection of the fact that there is some greater light that beckons beyond. I mean, I have a theory. My theory is that we know the Talmud tells us that the temple was destroyed on account of baseless hatred. And we'd been in exile for 2,000 years since. But frankly, I think we've been fixing it. With the Rebbe, with Chabad, there's been so much more of us, Yisrael, that's been generated, more Jews being engaged, etc., etc. So this pandemic, that's what we would call Maisasatim. That's the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, coming to create quite literal isolation. If he couldn't any more generate or engender the, the hatred, as it were, so he would isolate everybody from each other. We all had to be locked into our own rooms, our own enclaves, wherever it is besides, but separated from one another. But a mistake he made, and a big one, because the kind of chesed that was being demonstrated throughout the course of COVID, the kindness, the compassion, the way people exerted themselves to care and reach out for other people, kind of exceeded all of expectation to a point where he was suddenly almost really out of a job. And here we are, on the cusp of Mashiach. We've actually come out of COVID. But the question is, now what? Do we revert back to old habits? Or do we keep up that incredible kindness and chesed that we exert towards or extend towards one another? We like to use this term bantered about new normal. Well, what does that actually mean? We're looking to step into that new normal. When Mashiach comes, it'll be the world running as it was, the Ramam tells us, normal, but it'll be new normal. We can make it happen. It's about to happen. All right. What does Judaism say about becoming a millionaire or a billionaire? Other than highly recommended, but I mean... Yeah, it is highly recommended. There's, there's nothing inherently immoral about becoming a millionaire or a billionaire. You're not a moral person when you have $999,999 in the bank, and as soon as you cross the threshold into millions, you're all of a sudden immoral. What God is more concerned about is what we do with the money. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the, the compiler of the Mishnah, was a very wealthy man. And the Talmud says, there's discussion that he would honor wealthy people, would show them honor. Now, if he's wealthy himself, it's not like he was trying to kiss up to them to get a nice donation for a nice yeshiva. And Rabbi Hudanasi is the same person who, at the end of his life, put his hands into the heavens and said that he didn't benefit from the world, from any of the pleasures of the world, even to the extent of a pinky. So if he wasn't interested in the money, and he wasn't interested in what money could buy, the pleasures associated with it, why was he honoring wealthy people? And so he said, the reason is, the reason that's explained is that when a person gets wealth, when God decides that this person is going to have more money, that God has entrusted them with a larger mission. They have more resources to do their mission. And so the fact that they, that God trusts them with such a mission, this Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi felt was worthy of giving honor to. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. To the well, new well, billionaire what if, in Chabad. What if, what if you can be a billionaire? <laughs> What if you can be a billionaire and you settle for being a millionaire? Is that a sin? Is that a rhetorical question or a statement? It's a rhetorical <laughs> question. Of course it's a sin. Rabbi Shochet, I, I absolutely you want to translate concur. this into pounds or you, or you got the dollars and it doesn't matter? <laughs> the, dollar, the pound is in dead air at the moment anyway, oh, okay. but that's beside the point. The, the, uh, what Rabbi Friedman just said is absolutely so. God has an allocated amount that's predetermined for us to be able to achieve and aspire to. If you're not getting the billion that you are able to, to achieve, then that means that you're doing something wrong along the way to be able to necessarily receive that bracha, whether it's in the context of tzedakah or whatever else. So you go after what you can do. But remember, God blesses you in all that you do. You have to do what you have to do, but remember that ultimately it's still God's blessing. Birchas Hashem Hitashir. It's God's blessing that makes you wealthy. Acknowledge that, recognize that, and reap the dividends. Thank you, Rabbi Shocha. Rabbi Friedman, why do rabbis get involved in medical questions and dilemmas? Should, shouldn't such matters be left exclusively for doctors and medical experts to decide? Oh, that was in the good old days. When medicine day. worked and everybody knew what they were doing. <laughs> now the question is, who knows what they're doing? The best combination is an expert medical opinion with an expert halachic opinion, 
And if they coincide and they agree, that's a healthy way to go. Okay, well said. Any the rabbis beg to differ or beg to agree? No, the only difference between God and a doctor is that God doesn't think he's a doctor. And that's There's no why, offense, and by that's the way, why, no offense taken. I just want to, disclaimer. <laughs> and that's why you need the rabbi there for that kind of balance. All right, I'll throw in an extra million for you on that one. <laughs> rabbi Taylor? He's good, all right. Uh, rabbi, uh, rabbi Shochet, as a rabbi, what's the best advice you can give someone to lead a meaningful life? Question, second part of the question, if you can come back to this world, is there anyone you want to be, who would it be? Before you start the clock, those are two completely separate questions. Well, I'm sorry. You know, I'll give you 30 seconds for each one. Well, <laughs> in regard to the first question, you know, there are two types of people in this world. There are some people who wake up and say, good morning, God. He's going to have a great day. There are other people who wake up and say, oh, good God, morning. Him, not so much. Number one, don't be that guy. When you do wake up in the morning, remember, when a lion wakes up in the morning, he knows he has to run faster than the slowest gazelle. When, and otherwise, he's not going to eat. When a gazelle wakes up in the morning, he knows he has to run faster than the slowest lion. Otherwise, he's going to get eaten. So when you wake up in the morning, whatever you do, make sure that you are actually up and running. Number three, there are two types of people in this world. There are those who act without thinking, and there are those who think without acting. Be neither of those people. Make sure that you always think and then translate that thinking into action. Sometimes life overwhelms you. Sometimes you might feel you're enveloped in darkness. Don't see yourself as being buried. See yourself as being planted. Grow from the experience. And finally, in the timeless words of the Rebbe, when you do all that, Keravelt, turn the world upside down. Do what you need to do to make your difference, to bring redemption to all of this world. And for the second part... Of the question. Who would I want to come? What's that? If you come back to this world, does anyone, if you could come back to this world, does anyone you want to be, who would it be? At running the risk of sounding arrogant, Yitzchak Shachet. And why? Uh, it doesn't say anything about why, it just asked. Can I? Can <laughs> but go I, ahead, go ahead, you can qualify it. It's the famous story of Reb Zusha, who said, when he comes up to heaven and God says, why were you not like Avraham, Yitzchak, or Yaakov? He says, I'll have a ready response for each of those. You, God, you appeared to Avraham. You never appeared to me. You gave Yitzchak the option to sacrifice himself on the altar. You never gave me that. Yaakov was the father of the 12 tribes. I was only a father of a couple of kids. He says, whoever they ask me, I'll have a ready response for. There's only one question which, if they ask me, I won't have an answer for. And that is, if they ask me, Zusha, why weren't you Zusha? And the point is, as he's just teaching us, God didn't put me in this world to be an Avraham. He already had one. We're not here to duplicate. I'm here to be Yitzchak Shacha, to achieve my personal objective, to make my contribution in a way such that nobody else was ever able to do. So if I need to come back, I'd like to come back as myself to finish the job if I hadn't already done so. Well said. <laughs> Rabbi Pinchas Taylor, many Chabad Hasidim make it their mission to put tefillin on as many non-religious people as possible, including many who never put it on before and will likely not do so again. Does the, that one isolated mitzvah really matter so much? A few years ago, I was on a, on a plane to the Holy Land taking a birthright trip, and there was a gentleman sitting next to me who was a teacher in a yeshiva in Baltimore. And he's asking where we were going, what we were doing, so the plan is to hopefully to get these kids, get these young people more involved in their Jewish identity. And so he said that he really praised the work that Chabad does, but he never understood what the idea of getting one Jew to do one mitzvah was all about until his friend, his, he had a rabbi a friend of his who he called a Kiruv rabbi. And this Kiruv rabbi, who outside the Chabad world, people who are bringing Jews into observance further, this Kiruv rabbi had a group of college students that he interacted with, that he taught on a weekly basis. And this rabbi had a tragedy in his family. His son passed away. And so what the students decided they were going to do was they were going to spend one Shabbos, keep one whole Shabbos in honor of the son. They're going to do this one mitzvah in honor of his, in, in honor of his son. And so this rabbi I was sitting next to asked his friend, the Kiruv rabbi, that's, that's a really beautiful thing that all these students were going to keep one Shabbos, 
But tell me, what's really the value of just one Shabbos, right? Last week, they were in the clubs, most likely. Next week, they're going to be in the clubs doing whatever they were doing. What's the value of just one Shabbos? And so the key of rabbi told this gentleman that was sitting next to me, he said, I would give anything in my life to spend just one Shabbos, just one more Shabbos with my son who passed away. And our Father in heaven feels the same way. Just one Shabbos, just one mitzvah has eternal value. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. Beautiful. I got one last question here before I'm going to open this up to the audience. So in the event you do have some questions, start formulating them in your minds. When you do ask your question, please keep it succinct. And again, speak clearly and loudly. Last question, Rabbi uh, Friedman. As a Jew or Jewess, why can't I marry a righteous non-Jew with the hope of him or her converting? First of all, it would not be fair to expect someone to convert for your sake. Either they convert for their own sake or it's not really a conversion at all and you do not make that kind of condition. It's not, not fair, it's not right. Secondly, by definition, Marriage means a reunion of two parts of a single soul that got divided at birth. Any other kind of union may produce a wonderful result and you can live happily ever after, but it is not a marriage. A Jewish soul and a non-Jewish soul are not parts of the same soul. So unless the conversion is real, honest, sincere, and true, their union can be a very fine union, but it is not a marriage. So let's go by the definition of what marriage means. The reunion, two parts of a soul that got separated at, mar- at, at birth, that, who rediscover each other and be, uh, become reunited. So either, again, either it's a real conversion and this is a Jewish soul which is a part of your soul and you are reuniting, or it's not a marriage. Rabbi Shacha, you look like you were getting ready to say something. No, no, I... I I was just reading your mind. I wholeheartedly agree with what Rabbi Friedman just said. You think that's the sole answer, what he said? I mean, is there something else you want to add? Other than because I know that these questions have a tendency of being sensitive and lest somebody misconstrue the brilliance of what Rabbi Friedman just said. Just to emphasize, if somebody has already converted properly in accordance with halacha, they are absolutely Jewish and they are the appropriate soulmate for whoever marries them. So that's perfectly okay, acceptable Sustained. and endorsed. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to open this up now to the audience. Um, we got a question right here. If you bring the, you bring your microphone. So my question is, tzaddik or schmuck? Trump. Whoa. <laughs> You know, there's a reason why I was surprised when he said we're taking questions from the audience. (laughs) They tend to avoid it for that reason and that reason only. Okay, any other questions? (laughs) Remember whose hotel you're staying in here, I'm just saying. (laughs) Um, I I don't know if they want to get into a political statement. I'll leave that to the rabbi's decision. I live in the UK, and I'm Canadian. I'm okay. Everybody has their personality flaws, and everybody has their very very real ability to do some amazing good. A lot of people are riled by Donald Trump because maybe some of his crass approach and attitude towards things or the way he expresses himself. Oh, gosh, he just walked in the back door. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But at the same time, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. So some things that we have to absolutely be grateful for. All right. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shokhet. The brave one from the British Empire. (laughs) Please go ahead. Okay. If somebody has lost, let's say, three spouses in their lifetime, which would be very sad, and then there is a resurrection, do they all of a sudden have three spouses? Rabbi Friedman, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) No, they don't have three spouses. They do have three soulmates. Now they can marry whichever one they want. There you go. That's going to be fun. (laughs) (laughs) We got some questions here to my left. The real question is if those three all really want to go back to him, right? (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Rabbi, for holding this. 
Um, given the fact that we reject science as a belief system because of its um, necessarily falsifiable hypotheses based on theories, based on axiomatic truths that are arbitrary, why do rabbis find it fit when using logical proofs and scientific proofs for Judaism to understand like certain laws or things that we uh, hold? Dr. Taylor? What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> he wants me to translate it in English. <laughs> Basically, given that, given, given that science is a bunch of theories and stuff, and we reject it as a system of beliefs, why is it that rabbis see fit to use science and scientific proofs when we're talking about Judaism and things that we're supposed to do? Uh, Dr. Well, Taylor, are you still here? <laughs> who, who says that we reject science? But there's a paradox in your question, because you talked about science, and then you said rabbis reject it as a belief. As a belief system. As a I belief mean, system. As there's, like against God. But like there's God. the point. Science as a science, or science as a belief. Belief system, by its very definition, implies that you accept it as absolute value. It's not a belief system. We have a principle, chokhmah bagoyim tamin, which means when there's intellect and there's um, intellectual prowess that is even offered outside of Judaism, yes, you can embrace it. You can wholeheartedly embrace it to further endorse something that, or a point that you want to actually make. But when there might be a direct conflict between the theories of sci scientific theory and fundamental Jewish beliefs, well, then I'll hold this up to scrutiny on the basis of belief, and I'll hold this up to scrutiny and determine if it stands or otherwise falls, and then I'll embrace the belief over the fallacy of this which doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Thank you. Dr. Taylor, do you concur? Uh, just maybe, maybe to add another point that we like to think of science sometimes as being this sort of objective reality without the backdrop that science and the way that science is given over and related also comes with it certain trends and certain back, uh, backdrop belief systems. So you have someone like Isaac Newton, who everyone agrees is a pillar of science, who is a strong believer in God. Just because the there is a, a group of people nowadays, let's say, that assumes naturalism and that God is excluded from the equation of what can be considered viable, uh, viable information, doesn't mean that that becomes the science, That's, that it's, we're working with a, a different backdrop that shouldn't necessarily be included in our... Thank you, Rabbi Taylor and Shochat. Next question, please. Hi, uh, so earlier we talked about how if we don't reach our potential, it's potentially, it's sinful, like we gave the example of if you're a millionaire, you're able to become a billionaire. If you don't reach for that billion, it's a sin. So my question is, how do we know that we have that potential in the first place? Because after all, for example, reaching that millionaire status is, is in, in and of itself, you know, pretty impressive. So how do we know if we even have the potential to move, to go past that? Rabbi Friedman, please go ahead. Well, don't limit yourself. We don't know until we've tried and we don't know until it's over. So to put a limit on it is unnecessary and not, not correct. Somebody once asked me, I'm getting very rich and I'm afraid. Should I stop? <laughs> There's no need to be afraid. It's all divinely orchestrated. And if you can be richer, then you should be. If you can know more, then you should know more. If you can do more, you should do more. If you can love more, you should love more. And you don't put a limit on it and say, I'm afraid to go beyond this point. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Next question, please. So I see that it feels like about maybe half of people that I've had in my classes have divorced parents. So my question is, if, especially if you have divorced parents, why should you get married? Other than misery loves company, Rabbi Friedman, do you have something to add? <laughs> it is such an amazing thing. People get married. And nobody can claim, or very few people can claim, that they had a wonderful role model in their parents' marriage. And yet we get married. I know there are some who, who are terrified. But those who do get married, it is so amazing how we are incorrigibly optimistic 
and believe in the right things and will try even though, you know, logically, it seems like it's not working and not worth the effort. So it's an amazing thing that the human spirit can overcome despite what we see, we know what is right. So if you want to break it down, there are facts and there are truths. The fact is marriage is very difficult. That's a fact. The truth is marriage is wonderful. So you handle the facts, but you pursue the truth. Can I add to that just an interesting observation? Men and women are diametric opposites. The whole notion of marriage makes no sense. There was a French teacher who was explaining to her class how nouns in French are different than their English counterparts, masculine or feminine. La maison is a house, feminine. Le crayon is a pencil, masculine. And then somebody, as opposed to in English, someone asked, what about a computer? Is a computer masculine or feminine? So she divided up the class between the men and the women to come back after an hour with their conclusion. And the men came back after the hour and concluded that a computer is most definitely feminine. Why? Because number one, they store mistakes in long-term memory for possible later retrieval. <laughs> Number two, they communicate with each other in a language incomprehensible to anybody else. And number three, number three, no sooner do you acquire one, you end up spending half of your paycheck on accessories for it. <laughs> but the women concluded that a computer is most definitely masculine. Why? Because you talk to them and they don't respond. Because they're supposed to help you solve the problem, but half the time they are the problem. And number three, if I dare say this, because no sooner do you acquire one, you realize if you waited a little longer, you could have had a better model. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rabbi. We had one more but let me finish the point. Ultimately, we get married because God tells us to get married, because God instructs us to get married, and we have to work through it. And it's challenging, and sometimes, sometimes we mess up in the process because we make mistakes along the way. And that can, God forbid, actually lead to divorce. But that doesn't mean that the child is going to end up repeating the same mistakes of the parent. The child still has to aspire to do what God wants him or her to do. Thank you, Rabbi Shochet. You have a question there. Okay, so we learn that in order to serve Hashem, we have to do it in the most, like, 100% into it. But how can, you, how, can, how can one serve Hashem if they're not comfortable with themselves, with their body, with their sexuality, with their identity, any of the above? <clears throat> it's eeny, meeny. Isn't, that, isn't that time for... Who's Mo? Isn't that time for dinner? Oh, Rabbi Freeman, you're Mo today. Let's go, Rabbi Freeman. <clears throat> it's an incredible thing that our capacity to serve has actually grown and increased, not decreased, as a result of corona and the lockdowns and the, all of these things have made us more available to serving rather than less available because it really has brought home the message it's not about me. It's not about me. My life is not about me. My life is not for me. That's a terrible mistake that we make and we suffer for it. And that could lead to wondering, am I the right gender? Am I the wrong gender? Why am I this way? Why am I that way? If we serve God and we are so ready to do that, then whatever we are, if it serves his purpose, I'm fine with it. I'm flexible. I'm Jewish. Do I have to be Jewish? Couldn't I be born non-Jewish? And if I was born non-Jewish, I would say, do I have to be non-Jewish? I am what I am for a good reason. And I accept it because what do I care? I'm here to serve. That would save us from so much agony and so much grief, and it would make God so much happier. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. We've got time for like two more questions. In the back. Um, I can't see. This is like, you know, like a TV set. <laughs> I, I can't um, see anybody out here. <laughs> 
What would the rabbi say is the best spiritual lesson we could take from the entire COVID experience, from the original diagnosis, the fear, the panic, the uh, shelter in place? What's the best? Everything is a, is a lesson in the service of Hashem. What's the best lesson we could take from that whole experience? Rabbi Taylor, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd related a little bit to what Rabbi Shachat had mentioned a little bit earlier about the coming of Mashiach. You know, everything that God creates in this world it says that he made it zel umad zeh, one thing opposite the other. That means that when something is happening that is perceived as real bad, worldwide terrorism, coronavirus, whatever it is, when things are openly appearing to be negative, that maybe not as a parent, but there's good stuff brewing because the rule, the way that God made the world is zel umad zeh. As, as much negativity as there were in the world, there's equally amounts of, of positivity and, and good things happening. So although it was a, a terrible pandemic and we're very thankful that we are through it, we should all know that behind the scenes there are, is also good stuff brewing and we are moving in, in the direction of our destiny. Thank you, Rabbi Taylor. We had some questions. Who has the microphone? Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, we'll so move to the along, center section next. <laughs> along with what Mana with Rabbi Friedman was saying about marrying a Jew instead of a non-Jew, weren't Jews like all like weren't Christians, Catholics, everybody else, all Jews at one point, and then when Jesus came, he started a new religion. Rabbi Shochet? Uh no, I mean it is true he started, or not even him, he didn't start the new religion. The Gospels who came later misconstrued a lot of whatever happened and created the new religion. Let's make that perfectly clear. But in reality, there were the descendants of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. God stipulated, Ki bi Yitzchak yikari l'chazara. Abraham had two sons, Yitzchak and Yishmol. So Yitzchak is through whom God was going to declare his chosen people. Not to denigrate Yishmol, but they were not essentially part of God's chosen people, not the Jewish people. Then from Yitzchak, there came Yaakov and Esau. So from Yishmol came the whole Arab nation. From Esau came the Romans, ultimately what you might describe as Catholicism, etc., but there was Yaakov, and from Yaakov, the 12 tribes, and we all descend from those 12 tribes. So it's never the case that there were everybody was Jewish. What is the case is that we were all Israelites, if you will, and we were Jewish in the certain sense of being the offspring of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. But when we all stood at Sinai, we were effectively all, at that moment in time, converted into Judaism. So the religion, Judaism, came into play, came into being, at the giving of the Torah at Sinai, where God then gave us the mandate of how to conduct our lives as his chosen people. Thank you, Rabbi Shoch. We've got time for one last question. I think in the back we got a break. Yeah, thank you, Rabbis. Um, after you pull away the layers of societal stigma and government regulations, what's Judaism's true view on the usage of uh, psychedelics, especially natural psychedelics like magic mushrooms uh, oh, for the I'm use of favor, transcendence? I'm personally speaking. I mean, no. Um, Okay, Rabbi Friedman, go ahead. Uh, can I go back to the question of the virus? <laughs> no, I was going to do that anyway. Uh, there's a difference between a virus and a bacteria. There's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria. You want to get rid of the bad, you don't want to get rid of the good bacteria. That's dangerous. Viruses don't come in two forms. They're all bad. There is no good virus. And that's because a bacteria is a living thing, a living entity, Organism. good or bad. But a virus has no life at all. It's a parasite. It is not alive. It steals life from what is alive. That is a perfect description of the three conditions in the world. There is holiness. There is the neutral stuff that can go good or bad, like a kosher piece of cake. It can go bad, especially the third one. <laughs> or it can be good. You celebrate a holiday, you celebrate Shabbos with a piece of cake, beautiful. Becomes holy. Then there is what is forbidden. The things that are forbidden are not bad bacteria. 
They're viruses. They have no life. They just draw life away from holiness. And that's why it can't be redeemed. It can't be used for good purposes. It's a virus. The only thing to do is get rid of it. So that gives us a picture exactly of where we stand in the world. The viruses have to go. The neutral stuff has to be utilized in the best possible way. Going back to being a billionaire, if you can do that, then you have the maximum use of the good side of the bacteria. And then there is Mashiach himself, pure godliness, which is God's vision for the world. So we are making more and more of the bacteria into godliness, from good to godly, and we are getting rid of more and more of the viruses that are lifeless and useless, and they simply have to go. It's the bottom line, magic mushroom, good or bad. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we would get rid of it. A big round of applause for 